man, um, I think God's moving here, and, and I hope that your spirit can connect with it. Um, man, we're not just doing church. Like, we're, we're literally rescuing people from hell. In fact, this morning, during the 8.30 service, there was somebody that was sitting in service and texted a friend, said, get online right now, you need to hear this. And that's the first part. And her friend watched it and said, oh my goodness, this is exactly what I need. I'm going to be at that church next week because God was speaking to me right in this situation. I'm not even done yet. There was somebody sitting in our overflow. And Drew texted in our staff and said, someone, someone just made a decision to follow Christ in overflow. Come on, somebody, right? Like... Come on, we're on mission together. We're on mission to help every person take a step closer to Jesus. So whether you've been following Jesus for a few decades, anybody in the house, you've been following Jesus for a few years, come on, let me see you. Come on, way out there. Hey, guess what? God has a step for you. Do I have any noobs in the house? Some just beginners. Like, I'm just trying this out. Anybody bold enough? Come on, where you at? Come on. Anybody? God has a step for you. Well, it's into this attitude of worship that I want to bring our scripture. We're beginning a brand new message series called Dream Again. And we're going to go to Joseph, the story of Joseph. We're going to go to Old Testament. And we're going to be in this series really all the way through December, right before Christmas. And so if you have somebody in your life, man, that could use this to, to dream again, to have hope again, to have a belief again, this would be a great series to bring somebody who's struggling and uh, maybe if you're struggling, hey, don't miss a week. It's going to be great. But Genesis 37 verse 5 says this. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, uh, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered uh, around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. Can I tell you that you have an enemy of your soul that wants to come against the dreams in your mind and the words in your mouth, what you speak over your life. And so we're going to talk about this idea of dreaming again. I want to title this message, if you're a note taker before we sit down, I want to title this Dare to Dream, Dare to Dream. So can you find three people before you sit down? And can you just say, I dare you. I dare you. I dare you. So good. For those of you who are single in the house and you're sitting next to someone who is single, that was a great pickup line. <laughs> but uh, dream again, dream again. Um, there was this game that we used to play. I don't know if you played this, uh, Truth or Dare. Anybody ever play Truth or Dare uh, when you're kids? Like, I dare you to go, never, <laughs> to go ring the doorbell and run away. Uh, in our neighborhood, there was a big dog that one of our neighbors had, and it was always, I dare you to jump the fence, touch the house, and come back. How many of you guys know that's not a fun dare? You're like, <laughs> you're scrambling, trying to run as fast as you can. Um, in college, we went to uh, a set of cliffs on a lake, and we were doing some cliff diving. And these are smaller cliffs, maybe 20, 30 feet. Um, and there was always one person in the group that was a little bit of a daredevil, you know, that would always push the limits, that would always go too far, um, that was almost a little foolish. Like, bro, like, come on, man, like, that's too much. Um, and we were jumping off these cliffs, and there was a set of cliffs a little higher up, and so we're there, and there's a big crowd, a lot of people hanging out, it's a Saturday, and it's a popular spot, and then up, up higher, there was a set of cliffs that are like 60 feet high, um, and someone said flippantly, man, I dare you to jump off that, not thinking that someone would actually do it, because it was one of those things that was like too far, too scary, there's no possible way, uh, and this individual who uh, always seemed to push the limits and was always somewhat of a daredevil, uh, we all have those people in our life. Maybe you're like that. Um, he walks up to them, us not thinking he was actually going to do it. And when we got up to the top of the cliff, we were convincing him, like, please don't, no. They're like, we, no, please don't. Because you could see 
trees down underneath the water. Um, and we were like, if you jump off, like, I'm not jumping off to rescue you. So, like, don't jump off and break your leg. And, and almost in the middle of us trying to convince him not to do that, we were like, please don't, don't do this. He takes off and jumps in the lake. And there's that moment between when he hits the water and then before he comes up, right? And, and he's down under the water, and we're thinking, oh, my goodness. And it was like three seconds lasted three minutes, and you're thinking, oh, is he going to come up? And then he pops out of the water, and he's like, whoa, you guys should join us. And we're like, no, we're not going there. No way. But I think people who are somewhat daredevils or somewhat that, that can then take on a dare, uh, they're, they're a little bit more courageous than sometimes we are. Now, they call it courage, we call it foolishness. Uh, they may call it bravery, we call it immaturity. We're like, we're not doing that, I got responsibility, I can't go there. And I think to dream is almost to have a little bit of courage, to have a little bit of what other people might call foolish. Like you may have a dream in your heart, uh, to do something significant, and all the people around you think you're foolish for even thinking that. Or, well, how immature, it's time to grow up, and, and you've maybe heard this language, it's time to give up on those dreams and, like, actually do something with your life. Uh, quit dreaming, stop going there. Um, and I think there's a lot of people, because of that, they've actually stopped dreaming. They've stopped dreaming and, and believing for what could be in their life, what should be in their life, what would be in their life. Um, I almost feel like um, a heaven dream is almost like a heaven dare. Like I dare you to believe it. I dare you to believe that there's more. I dare you to believe that, that you could do something extremely significant in your life. I, it's almost like, like heaven, when, they give it, when heaven gives a dream to our heart, it almost is like, I dare you. Do, do you believe you can do it? Do you, do you believe that this is possible? How, how many of you guys have ever been scared by a dream? Like God gives you a dream and you're like, oh, I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't think I could do that. That's completely out of my comfort zone. I, I don't know that I, I would be okay with that. I'm, I, I'm not sure of that. And because sometimes dreams feel so overwhelming, um, we actually just choose to ignore the dream or stop chasing and pursuing dreams. And so we settle into this mediocre, uh, mundane repetition of life where it's basically we live week to week, some paycheck to paycheck, some uh, basically vacation to vacation, some long weekend to long weekend, never dreaming for what could be, never dreaming bigger, never dreaming a God-sized dream. We, we, we stop daring to dream. We stop believing for what could be, and, and I get it because there could be disappointment, there could be something where it didn't happen. There could be difficult situations that have come up to, that cause you to stop dreaming. And you're going, well, I, I don't know that if that could even be possible. You see, I believe this, that the language of heaven is dreams and visions. The language of heaven, how God speaks to our hearts today is, is yes, through Scripture, but also through the Spirit of God in dreams and visions. In fact, Joel prophesied about it in the Old Testament. And it says this, and it shall come to pass afterward. What's afterward? It shall come to pass after the Holy Spirit comes, and you see this in Acts chapter 2, when Jesus returns to heaven, and the Holy Spirit begins to, to fill our lives and fall on believers, and, and it says, and it shall come to pass afterwards, and here's the scripture, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. So if this is what life should look like with the Spirit of God, I think that culture and life has a way of flipping it, has a way of, of, of reversing what Joel said would happen to where as we get older, we dream less. As we get older, we settle into just, well, this is the way it's always going to be. I can't change it. Uh, I, I'm stuck. And, and so we stop dreaming. How many of you guys ever realized that, that, that the older you get, it's almost like the less sometimes vivid your dreams get? You remember as a child or a teenager or as a young adult, you dreamed so, so vividly, and now you're like, I don't know, I, you, you forget what you dreamt. And it's almost like culture has this way of as you get, you get older, you stop dreaming, but, but also culture affects even our young men and women. Where, where right now there's a lot of young men and women who I feel like don't have a vision for their life. They, they don't have, have a vision for what God wants to do with their life and how God can use them. And so they just live from literally experience to impulse to weekend to Instagram posts to just kind of chasing the immediate, not pursuing a vision for their life. Now, how many old men and women do I have in the house? 
Thank you. I appreciate that. We need you. We love you. How many young men and women do I have in the house? Ooh, I love it. I love it. How many, how many in between? You're not ready to kind of give up. You're just kind of in the middle. Thank you. Thank you. Our church should be full of dreamers, full of vision seers, full of people who are believing for more, full of people who are dreaming again. And I think this is why it's so important as a church that we, we continue to dream, not just individually, but collectively. What could we do for the kingdom of God if we dream? What could we do if we got out of survival mode? What could we do out of just a, a, a coast, a just a, okay, we're going to go through and it just becomes this routine of like the same thing every week and then I end up going to heaven and after 80 years of my life without ever dreaming without ever believing for what God wants. And I think the difference between a dream and a wish is faith. There's a lot of people that wish things were different, but I wonder if people full of faith, full of the Spirit of God, rather than just wishing and hoping, began to dream and actually begin to see a picture of the future that was significant, that was different, that was bigger. You see, Joseph was a dreamer. Joseph was somebody who dreamed dreams, and they were audacious dreams. They were dreams that he had no business dreaming. Joseph was the, the youngest son in a, a family of 12 sons. Now, in Jewish culture, the youngest was the lowest on the low part of the totem pole. He was last in line. Jewish culture prioritized the firstborn son. The firstborn son got the rights. The firstborn son got the inheritance. The firstborn son got the respect and the power. And so you can imagine if, if he's not the firstborn, he's not even the second, third, fourth. He's the twelfth born. He's the last. He's the youngest son. And he's dreaming dreams that says, hey, guys, I have a dream that all you are going to bow down to me. That's some pretty crazy dreams. Like, they're probably looking at Joseph going, you're crazy. Like, you're foolish. You're ignorant. You have no idea. I wonder, I wonder how many of you, you've dreamed dreams before that other people have thought, you're crazy. No way. You can't happen. Not going to be possible. You see, Joseph goes from the youngest son to being pushed into a pit, to being sold into slavery, to being wrongly accused, to being imprisoned, to being forgotten in prison, to suddenly interpreting Pharaoh's dreams, to then ruling over Egypt and then reuniting with his family and feeding the whole world. And we're going to spend a, a few weeks studying the life of Joseph, but this morning I want, I want to kind of jump into this first part of Joseph, and I want to go to Joseph, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 5, this first verse, and it says, now Joseph had a dream. Joseph had a dream. If Joseph had a dream, let me ask you a question, do you? If Joseph had a dream, do you? Online, do you? In the room, do you, do you have a dream? Or have you stopped? Have you stopped because of disappointment? Have you stopped because you were tired? Have you stopped because, you know what, it just, life just got to you? And it, you know what, I, I, I've really stopped believing. I've really stopped looking to the future. I really stopped hoping. I stopped uh, pursuing what God could potentially want to be. And in Proverbs 29, verse 18, it says this, Where there is no vision, the people perish. I think when a person doesn't dream... Their spirit, their soul kind of dies on the inside. Yes, on the outside they may look the same, and on the outside they may go through the routines, and on the outside they may smile at you at church, and they may smile at you in your neighborhood, or they may say hi to you, but on the inside they're decaying, they're dying, they're drying up because they have no dream. They have no hope of what could be in the future. They have no picture of what the possibility of faith could bring. You see, I think when we stop dream, dreaming, we, we, we stop looking to the future with this idea that God can cause it to flourish. Our world begins to shrink. Our world begins to grow smaller. Suddenly the things that used to, used to not bother us suddenly get to us in such a way that, that causes us to get angry or causes us to get bitter or causes us to, to be more, more skeptical. I find this in my own life. Like when I, when I stop dreaming... When I stop thinking about the potential of the future, when I stop having God breathe on my heart to give me this dream, I, I start to find that my world gets smaller and smaller. I can look at all the blessings that God has put around my life, 
I've got a beautiful wife, four children, an incredible responsibility of leading an amazing church. And, but, but, if I, but if I stop dreaming, it's like all those things don't matter to me because the dream in my heart has gone. When I stop looking to the future and going, God, you can do it. Not with this wish of a roll of a dice, but this, this audacity, this daredevil spirit, this, this almost what people would look at and go, that's foolish. That's immature, Eric. Grow up, Eric. Move on, Eric. And when I take culture's advice to kind of go, okay, well, well, I guess I need to put that dream aside. I need to, I need to become an adult. <laughs> I need to stop having wishful thinking. I find my soul begins to shrink. You see, the minute I, I get along with God and I begin to pray. Now, I'm not talking about the prayers for the first 10 minutes when you dump everything and all the problems you have, which God's okay with. That's what a lot of us do when we pray. God, I got all these things, and I need you to do this. And then we go, okay, amen, and we leave. And we leave no room for God to begin to breathe on our heart. Come on, you've been there before. You've prayed. you said all the things you need to say. And I hear people talk to me all the time where they're like, well, when I pray, I just run out of words to say. And I tell them, I said, you think prayer is all about what you have to say. What about what God wants to say? What about sitting before the Lord and going, God, breathe on my heart? But it's awkward. Let's be honest. You're in wherever your prayer space is, and you've all done this. You go, God, speak to me. You guys ever had that awkward moment when you don't know how to leave, and you go, what would you say? And they're like, nothing. What, God, did you say something? No. God, God, speak to me. And I think sometimes we, we think that we can get a word from God in 30 seconds. It's almost like soul Starbucks. We drive through and get our, get our spirit caffeine. But my grandfather, who was a pastor, he used to talk about this idea of waiting on the Lord. Like, God, I'm not leaving until I hear your voice. God, I'm not getting up. Until I hear your voice. God, I'm not turning on the TV. I'm not turning on my phone. I'm not talking to a friend. I'm not, I'm not doing anything else. But I'm going to lean into you. And I'm going to hear from you. And I'm not going to say anything. You see, I think this, right? Like God does not have a talking problem. It's often we have a listening problem. Come on, if you have kids, you know this. Stop that. Stop, 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 stop. Don't, don't touch that. Oh, I didn't hear you. What? <laughs> I've been saying stop it for 30 seconds. I wonder if God's pouring dreams in your heart right now, and he's dreams and dreams and dreams and dreams, and then suddenly we go, what? And God's going, I've been, I've been trying to talk to you. You see, there's often times that a, that a fire does not need more wood. And a lot of times when you try to build a fire, and I know in our modern society how you build a fire is you should flip the switch and the gas comes on, and you're like, oh, a fire. But I, like a, I like, a, like a traditional fire. I like a throwback fire where you can smell the smoke, you can hear the crackles, you can see the coals. I like a fire that, like if you hang around it too long, you get hot, and you're like, ooh, I got to, you know. I'm not that much of an outdoorsman. Um, me and Bear Grylls, we're best friends. And, um, but one of the things about a fire is this, is, is sometimes I don't need to put more wood on it I just need to breathe on it. Like I, th I think there's a lot of fires of dreams in your hearts that have gone down, and it's not like God's got to put more wood on it. The coals of that dream have been fading, and really what we need is just God to come in and whew, begin to breathe on it again. And that's the beautiful thing is then the coals begin to glow orange and bright and you see the flickers of flame and you keep breathing on it. You keep breathing on it until the fire comes again. And I wonder how many people here this morning, dreams have gone dormant in your life and, and you need God to come in and begin to whoo, breathe on it. Here's, here's the deal. I want all of us at the end of this series to be able to go, God has given me a, a dream for my life. 
I, that's my end goal. I, I want all of us to begin to dream again, to begin to have the Spirit of God begin to blow on our life, have, have the Spirit come in and go, God, I'm giving, I'm giving my old men dreams and my young men visions, my young, young women visions, my old women visions, and everybody, whoever's the middle age, you can have both. As you straddle, you know what I'm saying? Dream again. Here's my thought is this, is that, that if I've stopped listening to God, I've probably stopped dreaming. So, so I have to begin to make room in my heart. I have to begin to make room in my life to begin to tune everything out and go, God, you've got to help me dream again. Because there's just something about somebody who has a dream in their heart. They live with a different confidence. They live with a different perspective. They don't settle for certain things that would affect their dream. They live with a different character. They live with a different faith, a different audacity to go, yes, I know God can do it because God gave it to me. So, so do you dream? Do you dream? Do you, do you ask God to go, God, you've got to breathe in my heart? You see, it's not necessarily enough to have a dream. I think there's times where we have to allow the dream to develop. And in Genesis chapter 37, verse 5, it says, and when he told it to his brothers. So, so the second question is, is, do we allow the dream to develop? Do we allow the dream uh, uh, of God to begin to develop in our heart? I, I think there are some things that probably we could have had a coaching moment with Joseph. Joseph gets a dream, goes right to his brothers. How many of you guys know there's some things in your life that you don't have to tell nobody about? I like to think of it like this. You and God can have some spiritual secrets. Come on, y'all know about that? Like, I, I can have some things that, that God's placed in my heart that I don't have to announce to the world. I can just sit on. I can just hold. I can just cherish. But Joseph, in his immaturity... <laughs> Come on, how, how are you thankful that God can use immature decisions and still turn them for good? Anybody ever make a foolish, immature, impulsive decision and God's like, hey, all right, that's probably not how I would have done it, but I can use it and we'll redirect it. How many are you thankful for that? You're here right now because of some immature decisions, right? So Joseph goes out. He gets a dream. He goes to his brothers. Now remember, he is, he is on the, he's down on the bottom. And he goes out, and he goes, guys, like, I got this great dream. Here's the thing. You're all going to bow down and worship me. I wonder if Joseph's expectations was immediately his brothers were going to go, oh, like now? Okay, yeah, okay, Joseph, we worship you, Joseph. How great you are. I'm 20 years older than you, but you're amazing. I think that's sometimes when we, when we prematurely uh, show our dream to people, sometimes we have this expectation that they're all going to be like, wow, that's so amazing. How can I now rearrange my whole life to make your dream possible? But oftentimes God says, no, 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 I've given you a picture of the future, but now let me develop it. Now let me work on it. I think the hardest Part about this is sometimes we want to tell people our dreams because we feel like the dream validates us, not the dream giver. Right? So like, so like it's, it's the dream that validates me, and, and we want to like flex on people to be like, well, I got a dream, and I'm going to be a millionaire. And it's like, well, how much you got right now? Ten bucks. But don't worry. Like, I got a dream. No, it's not the dream that validates me. It's the dream giver. So no matter what dream I have, whether big or small, it comes from God, and I can lean on that. That goes, I'm a son and daughter of the king, and because I'm his son and because I'm his daughter, he's given me a dream. I don't need dreams to validate me because he's already validated me. And so we want to we wanna show everybody. I remember the time when we had our first daughter, we were thinking about naming our daughter Mackenzie. I like the name Mackenzie. I like the Mackenzie Morris. I like the M&M, the whole idea. And, uh, and I think when you show people something important to you too quickly... It can actually corrupt it. Right? Like, like, there's just some people that just don't need to know everything. Like, there might be some friends in your life that don't need to know about the secret things that God's speaking to you. So I remember we were thinking, it's our first kid, you know, so we're doing all the books, we're doing the Google searches, and we, we're arguing about names and stuff like that. And, and I remember we were hanging out with friends, and they were like, well, what are y'all thinking about naming her? And we were like, we were all excited. We were like, well, <laughs> we, uh, we really like Mackenzie. Any McKenzie's in the house? I love you. I already love you. Hey, McKenzie, I love it, right? 
we love Mackenzie. And I remember the look on their face. They were like, oh. And I was like, it's not your kid, it's my kid. <laughs> but they had a little stank face on, like, what's wrong with Mackenzie? It's amazing, right? It's amazing, right, Mackenzie? Right. It's, it's amazing. We had a Mackenzie in the first service, too. She walked out. She was mad. No, I'm kidding. She was here. <laughs> It's amazing. Well, well, here's what happened. Suddenly, Natalie and I walk away with that, and we're like, well, did we pick something wrong? Is it, a, is, it a, is it a bad name? And it didn't happen immediately, but over weeks, we were like, well, maybe we shouldn't name her Mackenzie. Now, I'm thankful that God brought in Ella. We love Ella. It's beautiful. Ella is a beautiful name. Ella Joy, so special. But I think what happens is sometimes we reveal our dream too quickly to people who have no business speaking into our dream, and they go, oh, really? Like, you want to do that? Like, that's the biggest dream in your life? Like, what if, what if the greatest dream you have is to create a lineage of believers? So where it's not just you and your wife, but it's your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids that all follow Jesus. What if the greatest dream in your heart is to make a difference in generosity? What if it's to make a difference in serving? What if it's to make a difference in our city? What if it's to make a difference in your, in your workplace? And you, you go, this is what I feel like God is giving me, and he's developing in my heart. And you show it to somebody, and they go, oh. Because then we get into dream comparing contests. And then, and then here's the crazy thing. Then we start comparing. Well, why did God give them that dream? And why didn't God give me a dream like theirs? And here's the deal. You can't fulfill somebody else's dream. You can only follow the dream that God gave you. And so what do we do? We stop dreaming. Well, if my dream isn't going to be as good as theirs, I'm, I'm just not going to dream anymore. In fact, Jesus says, do not give dogs what is holy. Uh, when you see dogs, there's, there's a link to Proverbs. So every time somebody acts like a fool in Proverbs, he calls them a dog. Right? So one of the Proverbs says, like a dog returns to his vomit is like a man who returns to the same sin. Meaning, it's a foolish person. So what Jesus is saying is, don't give to dogs, foolish people, what is holy, the dream in your heart. It says this, do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. Can I tell you the dream in your heart is a pearl from heaven? And we've got to allow God to develop those things. I took a photography class in high school, and it was a film photography. So, so you had a roll of film, and, and I remember, like, you would take a picture, and you would see the image you want to capture. And that's like the dream. You, you, you see the image of what God could do, but then you have to go through this whole development process. And I think sometimes when, when we see the image and then we see the film, it's like how... How does this look like that? In fact, this is brown and negative, and it's like all weird, and the face is blown out. Then I have to go through this process. And then I have to expose it to a piece of, like, picture paper, and then I have to dump it into chemicals, and then I have to let the process take on. I have to do it all in a dark room. Because if I, if I expose it to any light, it will ruin it. Can I tell you there's some people in your life that don't need to be exposed to the things that God are putting in your heart. But we need to do this. God, if it's your dream, you're going to develop it. If it's your dream, you're going to work it out. And I'm going to hold it on. I'm going to keep asking you to breathe on it. I'm going to keep asking to trust you. Come on. I've got a dream of finding a man. I've got a dream of building a family. I've got a dream of, of making a difference in the kingdom. I'm going to let God develop it. If God is delaying the dream, here's the deal. He's still developing the dream. He's still developing. Some of you quit dreaming because God didn't have the, the, the timeline that you had for your dream. It took Joseph 22 years. Come on, anybody in here hold on to something for 22 years? I think the impulse of our society is God gives us a dream and we expect it the next day. God, where's it at? You told me that I would have this. Where's it at? Verse 8 says this, his brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. My last thought for you this morning is dreams will always make you different. Dreams will always make you different. Later in the chapter, his brother see Joseph coming and it says, here comes the dreamer. What a great accusation. 
What a great accusation for a person's life is here comes the dreamer. Here comes somebody full of faith. Here's somebody, somebody that, that God's speaking to, that God is marking. And, and can I tell you, when God speaks to you through dreams and visions and his scripture align, can I tell you the hardest part is that the fact that God is going to mark you because of your dream. Like, go ahead and just accept the fact that you won't fit in with everybody once you start dreaming a God-sized dream. Go ahead and accept that. That's why I love church. I, I, I want church to be this place where some crazy dreamers gather every week. And we're taking steps closer to Jesus. And we can encourage one another. And we can say, press on, brother and sister. Keep going for it. Because God has a dream for you. God has a dream in your heart. It doesn't have to be a place where we compare dreams. This is the place where we should be able to celebrate dreams. We should be able to celebrate them. Come on. Like, I, I never want to talk down to somebody's dream. I, I never want to look at them and be like, well, listen, okay, all right. That's a little unrealistic. You probably need to talk about that. Like, a little silly. I want to spur them on. I want as a church to begin to dream bigger than we could have ever thought or imagined. Why can't we dream to the fact that this, why can't a Victory City Church be on every corner of Austin? Why can't we have a Southwest? Why can't we have a Southeast? Why can't we have a Northwest? Why can't we have a San Antonio? Why can't we have a Houston? Come on, I'm preaching. Why can't we have a temple? Why can't we begin to broadcast the, the message of Jesus all over the world? That's a little foolish, Pastor Eric. Is it? Here's a dream. It's a dream so big that I can't do it by myself. There's some dreams in your life that you can't do by yourself, but so oftentimes we want to pick the people that are going to help us make that dream come true. But how many of you guys know we are not very good at drafting people for our dream? We are not good life general managers. Because God has people for your dream that you don't even know about. Joseph had no idea he would be in Potiphar's house. Joseph had no idea he would serve Pharaoh. I mean, if Joseph was picking his team, he would have told the dream and say, everybody bow down. And he thought, well, cool, my dream is now complete. I'm good. But God had something so much bigger. Dreams make you different. I think the challenge with dreams is this, is suddenly we begin to think different, we begin to behave different, we stop settling for things, we stop reducing our life down to basically a prison of schedule. Now I'm not talking about like a dream where you're like, God, I got a dream to have a Ferrari, and I promise you I will give people rides to church. <laughs> if you give me that dream, it'll be amazing. I'm talking about somebody who's dreaming to go, God, I want to be a millionaire, and I want to give a million dollars to missions every year. I'm talking about, God, I, I dream that, that literally I'm going to help women come out of abusive situations, redeem them, give them the confidence back, begin to build them up so that no matter what the abuse they've walked through, God, I'm going to see them walk as a woman of God. I'm talking about some dreams who, who maybe you never had a father in your life, but you're going to become a father of fathers. You're going to, be to call out men for what, what is in the potential on the inside of them. I'm talking about dreams that shake hell. I'm talking about dreams that build the kingdom of God. I'm talking about holy, in inspired, empowered dreams, right? I'm not talking about these little selfish dreams. God, is my dream to go to Europe. God will say, good, I'll send you there to become a missionary. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> whoa. I don't want to go to Europe anymore. A dream that is human impossible, hate or embarrassing, holy inspired dream, holy spirit inspired dream. You see, it was, it was actually those who hated Joseph that got him started towards his dream. Come on, can I tell you that if you have a heaven dream, you'll be in a hell fight? Let me, let me say that again for somebody who's watching this on YouTube three months from now. If you got a heaven dream, you're going to be in a hell fight. You don't think you'll have hate against you? You don't, have, you don't think you'll have opposition? But can I tell you that God is a miracle-working God that uses the very opposition that comes against you, turns it around, and propels you into your future? 
It's literally the thing. I was watching a movie, Interstellar, last night, one of my favorite movies, and they say they use the gravity, they use the gravity of of a planet or a star, and it slingshots them away. So the thing that was supposed to suck them in actually slings them and propels them. Can I tell you the haters in your life will be used like that? God will spin you around a hater, and you're going, God, why am I doing this? I'm on the dark side of the moon, right? I know that's an album, right? Like, I'm on the dark side of the moon, but God will use the gravity of hate and fling you to your future. God has a way of doing that. Now, on the dark side of the moon or the dark side of the planet, can I tell you, it's scary to continue to dream. Come on. God, did I hear you right? Or was that Mexican food? Did I hear you right? I had some menudo, and that menudo's crazy. I had that for the first time a few weeks ago. Never again. Never again. I don't want to know what's in it. All I know what it did to me. You see, God uses the opposition in our life and when it comes to our dream to be the thing and the catalyst to propel you forward. But the thing is, you have to continue to dream again. You have to keep dreaming. You have to keep getting before God. Say, God, I'm in a fight, but you keep breathing on my heart. God, I, I, I'm in a fight, but I, I'm going to hold this dear to my heart. I'm not going to share it with everybody. And God, I, I know this dream makes me different. That means I can't settle. That means I can't give in. That means I can't, I can't uh, become comfortable. I have to live with this audacious spirit, and it, and it might make me a little different. And when hate comes against me, God, I'm going to trust that you're using it for my good. You're using it for my benefit. You see, when we're hated, we are more like Christ than any other time. There's lots of people who are loved. Every celebrity you know, I love them. But Jesus, he was despised and rejected by men. Here's what I want you to see. It was the people who hated Jesus that sent Jesus to the greatest destiny of humankind. Those who hated Jesus crucified Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm just on the dark side of the moon, baby, because in three days, I'm going to whip around and I'm going to rescue humanity from all sin, death, evil. I have the victory in Jesus' name, right? But Jesus had to have somebody who hated him. If nobody hated him, he wasn't going to die. But death is what Jesus required so that you could have life. So the dream you have well, whether it's the enemy, whether it's people in your life, I want to challenge you with this last thought. Because I think it's kind of easy to dream for the first time. Like it is. Like it's easy to dream for the first time. It's easy to dream kind of like the first moment, the first iteration, the first rough draft. Which I'm going to talk in a few weeks about how to understand a dream's rough draft. Sometimes we sell out to the rough draft and God needs to make some revisions. But I think the most daring thing is this, is is not to dream for the first time, but to dream again. After disappointment. After struggle, after the fight. To dream again, and to dream again, and to dream again. And no matter what opposition you face, keep dreaming. No matter what difficulty you face, keep dreaming. No matter what problems you face, keep dreaming. Because God is developing, God is working, and I believe, Victory City, you and this church, we will begin to dream again. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Let's pray. Stand with me. I want to pray over you, and then we're going to worship. Um, and I want to pray that um, that maybe you're in a space right now where you, you've stopped dreaming. Where for whatever reason, you do not have a dream in your heart. I want to pray for you that maybe you have a dream, what I call, in development. And you're asking God, God, what's going on? When's it going to happen? 
Or maybe you're somebody here right now that you're facing opposition to your dream. You're facing a difficult moment in this situation. I just want to simply pray over you. The team's going to come up and they're going to begin to lead us in worship in just a minute. But will you bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you're watching online, if it's safe for you to do in your home, I want you to do the same thing. And, and here's what I'm going to ask you to do is this, is, is if you're somebody before the Lord and you're going, God, will you, will you put a dream in my heart? Will you come in to begin to breathe on my spirit, on my soul? I want to pray over you in this moment. And then we're going to worship. And we're going to declare, great are you, Lord, not average are you, Lord. But if you're here this morning and you're going, God, God, I need to dream again, will you kind of put your hands just kind of forward like you're, you're holding something? Just like this, just, just straight out. As a symbolic sign of going, God, I want to receive what you have for me. God, I want you to begin to, to place a dream in my heart. I want to pray in Jesus' name. I pray over every person. God, you see their hands, but you see their heart too. God, you've seen a heart that stopped dreaming. You've seen, you've seen maybe a, a spirit that, that struggled and, and they're facing opposition. And God, for whatever dream, for whatever reason, the dream is, the dream's gone dormant. The dream's dried up. The dream has never come. But Holy Spirit, in this moment right now, in this moment right now, God, I pray you begin to speak. I pray you begin to spark. I pray the embers of their heart begin to glow because you begin to breathe on it. And God, I pray over the next few weeks, by the end of this series, by the end of, of, of our journey together, God, they're going to be able to articulate with such clarity the dream that, God, you begin to place on their heart. That, God, they're going to be able to write it down like Habakkuk says, write out the vision and make it plain so others can run with it. God, I pray they're going to be able to do that. God, they're going to have the dream in their heart that you've given them or reminded them of, and they're going to have such clarity around it that, God, they're not going to have to rehearse the dream because they're going to know it by memory. They're going to be able to articulate exactly what God is speaking to them. Pray this in this moment. Holy Spirit, begin to move. Begin to breathe on hearts. In Jesus' name we pray.